Living a life is connected with suffering. It's pointless to judge because you're going to be wrong. Mm -hmm. They don't even know that it is possible to sink in this type of sphere. The suffering sometimes comes for us. They see no other option. It's like a one-way street. For the first time ever, I sit down with Master Xia Hung Yi to have a casual conversation on camera. The closest thing that I have done to a podcast, and I'm really excited to share this, where we sit down and we talk all things tea, the meaning behind the tea. We talk about inspiration, lessons and teachings that the tea brings you, and general life teachings as well. I hope you enjoy the video. If you want to support us, head over to www.mulliganbrothers.com where you can now get the Not A Journal that has finally been restocked. Use code JOURNAL for 10% off with the link in the description. The best success journal on the market. And thank you so much to everybody for all the feedback on this thing. Um, yeah, it's a special one. Thank you for the support. If you want to support Master Xia Hong Yi, please head over to Shaolin.online. So what, what makes that tea so expensive? No, actually, the number one is like really the age in mm -hmm. that uh, in that case. But I think to give you a a few a full understanding, let's say, or a better understanding here on this tea table, you have like I'm not sure if uh, you can see it. You have those two characters standing. Mm -hmm. This is the character for cha, meaning tea. This is tea, and this is the character for dao. Dao is sometimes translated as the way. So cha dao meaning the way of the tea. And there are existing still nowadays. Sometimes if you go to Asia, you find there are plenty of so-called tea masters. And now I'm not a tea master to just say it right in the front, but I have some understanding about it. And I'm still I'm still learning, but so far, how I bring together the way of the tea now in combination with what we call right now a tea ceremony, or actually it's called a tea appreciation ceremony, is that um, if you just think about where all of this tea is coming from until it really ends up here on the table, Meaning, in which year was that tea, let's say, grown? Then afterwards, in which year was it like, uh, uh, I don't know how we call it, was it taken? Yeah, By who was it taken? With what type of intention did the person who plucked the tea leaves took that tea? So what I mean by intention is, did he take it because he was thinking, I want to share part of my culture to the world? Or was the intention, I want to earn money with it. That's why, let's make it quick. Just put it in the bag and, and ship it somewhere. And I make it now a little bit quicker. But all the way from wherever this tea was growing until it arrives here um, in Germany right now, there is such a whole line of small variables that if you at the end add them up together, you will just come to the conclusion that you will never drink the same tea again. And now I'm just uh, in the stage of preparing, but there is something to the way of how this tree eventually is traveling until it really reaches the place where you want to drink it. And also right now, even that it has arrived, now it also matters how much quantity of that tea am I going to put into the pot? How hot is the water going to be that I will pour in? That's why sometimes we have green tea, white tea, yellow tea, black tea or poor tea. There are different temperatures sometimes, which people say is like optimal for the tea to open up its, uh, its flavor. And ultimately, of course, it's also the amount of time, how long you are letting the tea soak inside the, inside the pot. And all of this adding together, just meaning that every single cup eventually that you will drink 
is like one of a kind. And to have this type of, let's say, understanding, this type of background, just we're talking about tea, right? It's, it sometimes gives you some space for you also to now take that story of the tea and um, project it, for example, also to other people, which means everybody has a different history. Everybody has a different upbringing. That's why it's always not so easy to, yeah, to, to take that saying like with the first sight, I don't know how you say it, with the first sight sometimes you, you can judge somebody already. Mm -hmm. I don't think. There was a time I thought like this. I even like almost convinced myself that I'm right. But I always learned again and again, I was in most cases, my first judgment was never right. So that's where I also stopped doing it. Because what you see in the beginning about people, for example, it's the way how they talk, it's the way how they behave. So it's like you see the external aspects about them. But it's very difficult at first glance to get a glimpse of what is it that is fueling all of these actions, all of these behaviors all of these thinking patterns of persons. And that's why as long as you, as I think you don't know really the history, the upbringing and where somebody is really coming from, where he went through, it's no, it's pointless to judge because you're going to be wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is a little bit that idea of the tea appreciation leading eventually to the appreciation of people in your surroundings. Yeah. And yeah, in those ideas about being a tea master is also that understanding in the moment where you fully grasp the essence about the tea, they say you understand what life is. Because it's hidden inside there. Yeah. So, sometimes very philosophical, but of course there's some truth to it. Mm -hmm. Always is the question, how much can you relate to it? How much space sometimes are you taking for yourself to really sit back, have a cup of tea and then think about uh, things like this. And this is also why drinking tea, having a conversation while having a cup of tea is like a common thing in, let's say, Asian cultures. Some people still keep it alive, um, yeah. But that is like one point why it's called tea appreciation ceremony. It's the time to think about something essential. I love it. the 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 idea of applying that as well to people. Um, yeah, we we can judge so easily, especially when we put our own experiences and think that you know we 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 struggle to to not think that everybody's been through the same thing that we've been through and that they've got their own uh, past, their own story, their own life, and that they are away uh, for a certain reason. Uh, in terms of this tea, do you know any of the history of this particular tea we're about to drink? Well, that one is a so-called poor tea. And poor tea, I would say, is like between, like people say, it's the white tea first, then comes, let's say, the green tea, then come the yellow tea, then you have black tea somewhere, and then oolong tea also, different. These are different types of, it's all the same tea plant, but they are processed differently. So that means some are dried directly, some are then processed additionally, for example, um, processed with different flavors or letting it dry in special locations. And this poor tea is called red um, fermented tea. Uh, I think in the European world, it's, there's nothing similar like this. But if you are, for example, a coffee drinker and you would like to like switch to drinking tea, I think this would be the closest one oh, brilliant. that <laughs> somehow would be able to substitute that, that sickness uh, and that that strong, that strong taste of coffee. Now that one, 
my master who was here in uh, in the summertime he brought it from Taiwan and I do not know exactly where this is coming from but he told me it's a, it's a special one which is still coming from a very old communist time. Wow. So that must wow. have been a few years. And I think it's at least 40, 40 years old. Wow. Yes. So and it's therefore. It's older than myself. Yes. And you will already uh, probably feel by the taste that it's different. It's something different. Yeah, hard to tell. That's why right now. Let's see. I mean, I'm, I'm a huge, huge coffee drinker. Um, but obviously every time we visit the temple, um, you prepare us a lot of tea and I, I always enjoy it. Um, but I would love something that I could drink at home that I thought would, could replace the coffee. Um, yeah, I think it's more of a bad habit for myself, actually, the coffee is. <laughs> and now when it also comes to this type of how we're drinking the tea right now, uh, there are like small details, but I can maybe still explain. We have like three cups, for example, right now, mm -hmm. but only two people, you and me. Because the third one is the one that we are offering for all the ones that cannot be here with us, for example. So this is one aspect where things like the spirit, the ghosts, the dragons, all beings that cannot be seen in the world of forms, still we are in a way respecting them, respecting them and showing them they can be here, they can also be not here, but in case they would be existing, it's better you offer them something. So that's why we have uh, the third cup, or sometimes we also say you're offering it to, to the Buddha. Uh, if you are coming from a Buddhist tradition. And also the next thing I'm going to do, also sometimes really strange um, to, to people, is that all that the first flush is either used to heat up heat up the um, how do you call them the cups so first one is to heat up the cups and now the reason why I pour it for example over the pot is also that for every type of tea we're normally only using one type of pot. So this is, for example, our so-called poor pot. In, this, in that pot, I only prepare that red tea. I never pour any other green tea, white tea or yellow tea inside, because that is another understanding about the more you condition something, the more you expose yourself to something, the more it takes the color of it. And so also, Meaning now, if I translate it for my field of the martial arts, if I concentrate and I want to train myself in one specific area, I stay with that area for some time until I have fully taken all the essences that this teaching is transmitting to me. I do not mix up one day this teaching, second day this teaching, on the first day I learn from that person, a week after I learn from that person, three days after I'm not in the mood to do anything. So no, you stay with one thing and then you let time do the work. You just do the repetition, use the same tea over and over again. But what happens is that this type of material in that case, uh, it has the pores open and from time to time, the more often it happens, uh, it's taking already the flavor of that tea. So even without having any type of water inside, sooner or later, you will even have a very slight smell of that tea with that pot. 
And that also means it is a way of filling up something with life. Very similar to the question that we had a few days ago about yeah, what's the purpose of life? You give it a purpose. You give something life. For other people, this is just a, a normal teapot that maybe you can just buy somewhere or everywhere. I don't think so. You can place another cup, uh, another pot over here, which looks identical. But I know it's not identical because the one has no life behind him yet. That one is full of life, meanwhile. And so, yeah. And another functional, probably, reason why we are pouring off that first flush is also to get rid of, uh, let's say, if there is some dirt still inside the tea, that it's with the first flush that it's gone, you know. The, you know, with the, the Shaolin teachings and just the, um, the analogy with the tea of becoming the thing that you do so often, is there, is there teachings in Shaolin that talk about avoiding doing negative things, like avoiding, like becoming um, your bad habits or becoming the, the bad things that you think of? Yes. So, mainly a lot of the teachings within this organization, within the Shaolin Temple, that somehow are dealing with the character of oneself. A lot, a lot of these methods and teachings mainly come from Buddhist teachings. Yeah. And within that field of Buddhist teachings, it already helps to try and remove those judgments between this is something good, this is something bad. The way of what I think is useful to do is to think in terms of consequence. You can think like this, it will have a consequence. You can think like that, it also has another consequence. The same goes for thinking, talking, your action, your behaving. So these are the three areas where I think you have quite a lot of influence on the outcome of your life. How you think, what you think, how you talk, what you talk, how you do, what you do. These are the three things that are like in our hands. And now If somebody is really an unwritten piece of paper, if somebody would be like this and would have no glue, so okay, in which direction now should I point my life? How should I behave? What would be the proper thing to do? Then the Buddhist teachings made it actually very, very simple because they start first of all trying to put you into a framework that you understand why at all should I care about the Buddhist teachings. So that's why we are starting with the so-called the Four Noble Truths. The Four Noble Truths are first of all, these are simple statements where now everybody can just take their time and think about them. And that first statement, also called the first noble truth, means or, is, or it uh, expresses living a life is connected with suffering. Living life is connected with suffering. So, and now let's say, what do you think about it? Is that is there something that you can relate to? Would you say, mm, yeah? So whatever comes up for you, that is the first statement. Living a life is connected with suffering. This suffering can mean 
it's psychological suffering, mental suffering, at the same time going to the dentist, physical suffering, doing some type of really hard training, um, suffering or pain of your body as well. So different types of suffering. Sometimes I hear then people, people saying, uh, yes, but it sounds so pessimistic because life is also filled with joy and life is also filled with happiness. Yes, it's just that for this Buddhist teaching. It also is, life is connected with suffering. Now, oh, I'm sorry, you talked me through this just before. I How, what's the best way to drink the tea? Um, we usually drink it in like, I drink it in three, three zips. Okay. Yeah, but feel free. However, okay. Okay. It's, it's, okay. it's tasteful for you. Yeah, if yeah, you yeah. want smaller ones, up to you. Okay. I really see what you mean about the, co the coffee as well. Like, yeah, I could, I could replace coffee with this. And then, if I always drink this tea, it really reminds me, like, it has something earthy. Mm. Yeah, it has something like a root, like a, a very old tree, something like this. It really, really remains on there. Yeah. Like, just like <laughs> coffee, like it really, it really stays there. So, let's assume somebody would say, okay, let's listen to the second noble truth. That suffering has a reason. The reason why people suffer, the reason why suffering in this world exists, there are causes for it. These causes are greed, hate and ignorance or sometimes also not knowing. Greed, hate, ignorance, not knowing. Greed meaning the suffering sometimes comes for us because we are not satisfied with what we have. We want more from what gives us positive feelings, whatever that is. You can have a really, really nice relationship, a really nice partnership, but eventually also that one's gonna end. Not because you want it. Somewhere there is something which is gonna end it. And it's always that when something that gave you positive feeling starts to come to a change, that is that moment where then this suffering starts to arise again, for example. Now, hate meaning you get something that you actually don't want. You are confronted with something that actually you don't want. You want to have distance, nevertheless. You can't get to that distance because it just happens. So meaning greed is you don't get what you want and hate is you get what you don't want. So in both cases you feel already that the one thing is, if you are having positive emotions towards something, that one carries a seed of suffering. But at the same time, if you are having rejection for something, is also already carrying the seed of suffering inside of it. And maybe you remember the first time when we met, I had that chain and I was like explaining that push and pull from, mm -hmm. from that chain. In this world, if you don't pay attention that we are living, it is uh, based a lot on dualistic and polarity, on dualistic principles and on that polarity. Meaning, in the moment I push something away from me, so I move it, I touch the water. In the moment I move it away from me, there is no other way 
then one day you will have to face that it's coming towards you. Whatever you try to push away, it's going to come back. In the same amount, in the same, in the same, let's say, in the same energetic push, in the same energy that you have put it in to keep it away from you, that same amount of quality of that energy is going to come back. In the same way, whatever you liked, whatever you wanted to bring closer to you, the more you started to pull, the more you pull it, more, even close, even close, that one you will have to face one day, that the same amount of how you pulled is going to move away from you. That's why also yesterday, I think, living in this type of push-pull, you never get to peace. It's impossible to become peaceful like this. Why? Well, let's say there is one way. That would be you have incorporated change as a 100% aspect of your life. You are adaptable no matter what. If it's there, you're okay. If it's here, it's also okay. So you are part of the change. So that means at the same time also maybe you express it as you are in the flow and in harmony with life. If something is being offered to you, you take it. If something is being taken away from you, you let it go. If this is your real attitude, without any hesitation even, then I think you can also be peaceful, despite the facts of the fluctuation. And the second way to be, let's say, or remain in peace can only be one other aspect. And that one is don't even touch in the beginning. Don't push, don't pull. If you see something that you like, of course in that moment you can enjoy it, that it's there. And you can fully uh, immerse yourself in that moment when it is there. But just as it is leaving, you also return back to what is now real. And real is not that you wish it would still be here. Because it's not. It just left you. That's why to learn to be fully present. When something is being offered, you take it. When something is moving on, you let it move on without attaching yourself to it. Yeah? And that is also really a difference between you are not cold towards the things. It's not that you are not taking full part of life. It's the opposite. That you, that you watch into life and you realize it is like this. We will never have a world that will always be peaceful. That one does not exist. Yeah. So we, we have to learn and take the world as it is. But because we cannot change the circumstances, the only thing that we think is in our hands and in our mind is the way how you are learning to adjust your view and perspective in such a way that it makes it more livable for you. More livable and also, of course, if you have the chance to contribute in any way to make the life of the people that are closely surrounded uh, by yourself, to help them in any way, that's, that's what I think you should do. Yeah. And this is also why now this monastery, we call it a community. Because there are more individuals involved, but which all share in a way the same idea that, okay, before I start to change the world out there, let's just first start with this community. Then from that community, we have access to, let's say, this village, to that region. And then we can become bigger. But to be unharmonious amongst us 
and then now try to, okay, let's have a goal and change the world. No, it's not going to happen because you have already, you are already destroyed from the core. If we ourselves are not in harmony, if we ourselves are not in peace somehow already, how, how do you want to transmit something to, to other parties uh, that we for ourselves don't even have it yet? Yes, exactly. That's also like, maybe I'm jumping a little bit. But this is where that saying comes from. You can only give what you have. Mm. So, not knowing how loving yourself feels. How can you then, let's say, uh, talk to another person and say that you feel that love for another person? Not being responsible for your own health. Meaning to have that feeling you are responsible for this. That whole body, this system is only running because of your responsibility, because of your care. So there is a connection that you actually have to yourself. You care about this. You feel it is your responsibility to take good care of this. If you mess up with the mind, you're going to mess up this. So to have care for yourself, to take responsibility for yourself, what, what naturally arises is you know how it feels. You know how care feels. And because now that we have it, now it's a different quality. If you now take care about someone, if you now take responsibility over something. The same goes for, let's say, thankfulness. To sometimes uh, contemplate or meditate about how does thankfulness actually feel. If you're enjoying this episode with Master Shahung Yi, please consider supporting us at www.mulliganbrothers.com where you can use code journal to get 10% off the new journal with the link in the description. And because these type of, let's say, qualities in the Buddhist teachings, in the Shaolin teachings, we sometimes call them, these are like the qualities from the heart love, thankfulness, joy, compassion. Love, thankfulness, joy, compassion. These are four qualities, let's say, that are necessary to be developed if you want to take full part of this life, because that's the quality of life to be loving to yourself and then towards others. Only if you know what love is, you can understand what compassion is. Because compassion means, because you love, let's say, you have a feeling for yourself, then you project this feeling towards other people. Then you look out in the world and you, and you see the people that either they have not realized yet what they have. Or you see that they are being blocked or said by whatever that that love does not shine out from them. And because you feel this for them, that this is something which is missing in them, which is blocking them still, this is why the the feeling of compassion arises, that you would wish the best for that person, that eventually all the blockages, all the stagnation, all the fantasies and illusions start to dissolve and that natural feeling starts to come out again. That's why this love and compassion is so close related. And the thankfulness I think it has also something to do just with 
the way of the tea, the appreciation of the process, the appreciation of the uniqueness of individuals, and the thankfulness that no matter what, that we have this chance right now to be alive. Yeah. Other, some people complain about that they are alive, then commit suicide, which in terms of Buddhist perspective is one of the worst things you can do. Because it is like this nature, God, the creator, the creation gave you the chance, something very special, existence, and you waste it by committing suicide. This is how, like, I put it now a little bit harsh, but that's how it is. So it's like you disrespect the creator's creation. Yeah? And that's why like this thankfulness, this respect and appreciation for life is also um, something that we relate to as a quality of the heart. And yeah, and the other aspect, of course, this life, nothing is sometimes too serious. Therefore, joy. Sometimes you need those joyful moments where you come back to making the mind empty and return back to the stage that very often I think you can see in children. There is no predetermined concept yet how to behave when something, when that joy arises. And then when the joy comes, just let the joy be. Yeah, so, and meanwhile, in this world, if I look out, sometimes you really go, you, you just need to go out in the city here, in, in, in Germany, yeah, and it's that serious. You rarely see people walking, meanwhile, somehow, just on the street, and at least have a little bit of a smile on the face. It's very it's that serious. Business life even more. There it's not just about being serious, there you have the poker face. There you additionally add something up on top of the face, just in order to cover up what's the real deal. Now, this is where sometimes we are nowadays. And of course, these things have developed um, because there was probably a reason why it maybe is useful to have these type of attitudes. But to balance things out, I think it's also necessary to at least know about the existence that these, these type of qualities is something that not just in our tradition, but I think there are many traditions which are relating these qualities, love, compassion, thankfulness and joy to the core elements of the human being. So, and this is something that part of our curriculum inside this monastery is what we want to bring out. Because sometimes, of course, you can ask, so here in the temple, you're spending so much time doing all this type of training, going through the, the methods where it, it partially is so painful, there is no joy at all, yeah? But it doesn't mean that we don't like and we don't enjoy what we're doing. We still have our moments over here that are a little bit beyond any type of conceptual structure. Yes? Yeah. Yes, so and... One way of how you can get in touch again with the qualities that I just mentioned before is, let's just take mm -hmm. thankfulness. It is always this type of structure, also in the teachings in general. If you don't have it, you cannot give it. That is the, the core essence. So first of all, that also means we need to find a way to get Whatever we want to share one day, we need to get it. So, thankfulness. And the easy way is 
take yourself some time, can drink some tea. You need space for yourself. You need the space because now you need to go into the space. The space, for example, of your past. And you go through the moments that come into your mind where you think you were really grateful. Where you think you had this feeling of thankfulness. Somebody gave you something, you received something, you achieved something, no matter what it is. So it is something individual from your lifetime. The important part is that it must become real for you again. You try to call up again that moment where you felt this thankfulness. And in that moment where you then feel, ah, there is the glimpse of it. Now I can slowly feel it again. That was how it felt. Now it is what we call, now you are adding intention to it. Which means you are trying to multiply this feeling inside of you. So you are immersing into this feeling of thankfulness. And it's like, first it's that small seed, it's like a small flame. And now what you do is, you nourish that flame that it becomes bigger. Yeah? You be that it becomes bigger. That after some practice, you know very clearly that is thankfulness. It feels like this. Love feels like this. Compassion feels like this. And joy feels like this. And now that you have it, now that you very clearly can determine that's it. Now you can project it. In the moment you realize it in yourself, in that moment you realize it in other people. And this is like that, that really special part why I think there is no way around then developing yourself with all the skills that you think you want to bring out in this world or what you think is missing, is lacking in this world. Whatever you think is lacking there, we need to be the ones, first of all, to cultivate it in us. And afterwards, we can very clearly see in that area, they have it already, this area needs improvement. That one doesn't have it. And this is the idea why every monastery has a protected area. Because inside this protected area, you need sometimes to take your cup of tea, sit back alone and contemplate. And cultivate something inside of you first, before we then one day go out of the walls, go out of the gates and do the work. So that is maybe a little bit now also the explanation. Yeah, why is it so strict? Yeah, because on the one side, inside this monastery, it's not that we're here only like for the fun of it. It's also for the fun to express ourselves. But it is also to really develop something. Because is sometimes necessary to readjust if something is misaligned. Yes. And this can happen by being that by being that location where people can on the one side come to us and we try as good as we can to recalibrate them. But at the same time it can also mean that sometimes we need to go out if people cannot come to us. No, unfortunately, I was, I think, jumping a little bit with the, with the Four Noble Truths, but that was like my thinking, my, my thoughts in regards to greed and hate. Mm. Yes. And not knowing or ignorance. Let's start with ignorance, because that is maybe easier to understand. We humans have a very good intuition. Many people have a good intuition or meaning 
listen to yourself. If you listen to yourself, sometimes you already know the answer. The answer to come, let's go out tonight, have a party and let's, let's keep going a little bit. You already know. Yeah, you already know. But sometimes we just ignore it. And this is why then later on, sometimes the suffering comes. You knew it, but you ignored it. So that's why this is the third reason why a lot of suffering in this world is coming. Because between knowing something and putting that knowledge eventually also into practice, it's a different thing than doing, than knowing and doing what you know. Or knowing and ignoring. Then this does not like merge together anymore. So that is like one reason why ignorance is also one of the causes that can lead to what we call suffering. Yeah. And ultimately, not knowing, not knowing, I would refer and easily explain just like that picture what type of a day we have right now, meaning that you are not supposed to separate into day and night. We have both of it at the same time. But sometimes people don't know this. They don't even know that it is possible to think in these type of, um, in this type of sphere, meaning that you, under, you, you slowly start to grasp what is it actually that we are all embedded in. Embedded in a, in a world where day and night exist at the same time. Where life and death exists at the same time. Not chronologically after another. People don't know this because they still think in terms of chronological pattern. That sometimes also means they think in terms of, it, it, can, it will always go in one direction. Which direction? The direction that is propagated nowadays. You need to earn, you need to be positive, you need to be optimistic, you need to have success, you need to be young, you need to be beautiful, you need to be always having. This world is not telling you let go, support, give, death. Nobody is talking about that line. This is the line that is propagated. So what does it mean? You are being conditioned by whatever you are surrounded with. And if since a hundred years everybody is propagating that one, of course the mind is conditioned in this direction. So people don't know that this is only half the truth. And to slowly start observe, slowly start to contemplate about some essential things of this life where we are embedded in. That is giving you more options. That's the whole point about it. There is nothing in a way predetermined that you need to walk along this path. This is the idea of other people. To understand this one and to understand this one and to understand it's together. It's different. It opens different possibilities for you. Because you are not supposed to live a life what other people expect you to live. You live the life you, you expect from yourself you express from yourself, while, once again, of course, not harming others. But besides that, besides that, everything is allowed. Yeah. Now, that was the noble truth number two, which means the suffering has a reason, has a cause. The third noble truth is 
that there is an end to all of this. There is an end to the suffering. And the suffering ends in the moment where you find a solution for the causes. If the greed stops, if the hate stops, if the ignorance and the not knowing, let's say, stops, or you find a way to understand more, to stop ignoring, when the causes end, the suffering ends. And the fourth one, the fourth, the fourth noble truth, is then so-called, it now displays an easy structured way, let's say, an easy structured, structured path. Okay, I understand the first one, I understand the second one, I agree with the third one, now I really want to do something about my suffering and the suffering of the world. How should I start? And this is then the part where we are entering into the so-called the noble eightfold path. So these are now eight steps coming. And I just mention it right now, uh, maybe to you, because if people start to really search for the noble eightfold path, you find so much literature about it that I think everybody who, who feels like diving deeper into that field, they can do so now, because to start that topic, you're not gonna go home anymore. <laughs> I have to make a, I make a note of it. So the, the third noble truth is, there is a end to the suffering. End of suffering. Um, something that just links to that that I found interesting what you were speaking about earlier is the idea of suicide and it, be, it being, um, I guess, I guess some people make the confusion that that is the escape of suffering, that death, death is the escape of suffering. I mean, what is your opinion on, you know, we have a, probably a growing suicide rate right now on why that's the case and wh what people are going through at the moment? No, in a way it's, it's sad to just realize that sometimes people have the feeling that there is no other escape than that one. Already that there are people existing that are so desperate and are so much under pressure of having this type of feeling that there's no other escape than that one. That's already a sad story by itself, no matter where that pressure comes from. I mean now, um, one of, of the highest rates, as far as I know, is also, for example, Japan. Yes, and over there, very often also related to failing at work. Now, this is Japanese culture. It's nothing I would like to talk about because there are other specialists who know way more about it in the way also of what type of um, values they have. But there, one reason why people commit suicide, let's say, is also because of shame. They cannot take the shame of having, um, of having failed, let's say, in a certain area. But this is very much now related to a certain codex that you uh, have put upon yourself. But when we now switch away from Japan and go to the Western nations, over here the suicide is not being done because of shame. I don't think many of them are because of shame. There might be some cases, but the other ones is just... They see no other option. It's like a one-way street. And this is something that I think with the opening of possibilities, they need to be educated just in the same way. That's all, that's all what this is about. People need to know options. If nobody puts additional options in their minds, they cannot see it by themselves. And yeah, 
it's it's really a difficult topic. I don't I don't know what to say to this, to be honest. Yeah. You know, is I mean, when when you talk about the third level truth, like I just, I when I hear that and think about the idea of suicide, is I think the the confusion is there that that is the only escape. Is that that I think it's a for a lot of people, it's a feeling of trappedness that the the only option that they do have is to make the the suffering stop. Is to is to kill themselves, which is just yeah, it's such a terrible uh, a terrible thing. The idea of um, the lessons that have come from from drinking the tea, um, for for me, the like the respect, the um, the gratefulness to all those processes to get here. I'll be honest, my my ignorance of drinking, even any food preparation, can be overlooked all the time. You know, it's in front of me, it's there. I'm going to eat it, and that's that. And and the respect for the process along the way, and the and the mindfulness um, is not there as much as I would like it to be for myself. So I'm going to take this this tea ritual and really try and embody that into everything. Um, but the the idea of applying that to people as well, such a beautiful thing that I think so many people can do. We easily um, and far too often think that our experiences are what other people have experienced too. Um, and judge them accordingly, which it is it's such a terrible thing to do, I think. I'm, I'm interested, do you feel that we've covered all the lessons from, from the, like this ritual of tea? Um, do you think there's, there's something else there? I, I, I don't want to skip over everything whilst we've got you here in this ceremony. I'd love to just make sure we're covering all bases. So, no. This way also when we are having our food ceremony, mm. so before eating, we also have like a small prayer, which actually is expressing the same that we also talked about uh, right now over here. Meaning, from time to time, to be reminded, there is a story behind all of this. There is a story behind the food. Because Intention is what fuels life. Intention fuels life. So in the moment where you are eating a type of food, there is a difference if, there, if you have some connection to the food that you're putting into you, or if you blindfold it, just do that one. Just that at the end the stomach is full and you have the feeling of fullness. I am 100% convinced that there is a different way of how your body eventually is going to process the food that you were eating with a filled intention in comparison to the food that just like you don't even know exactly what it was. It just filled the stomach. And so that is what I mean is you want to have quality life. And that automatically only means for me, you fill up every moment and everything that you do, you are the one who fills it up with quality. You don't wait for anything to happen to make something be out of quality. You are the one, we are the one who can fill up whatever we're doing with quality. And in this monastery, it's in the eating, it's in the drinking the tea, it's during the meditation lessons, it is during the physical training. Everywhere we try to put as much as we can that reminder inside again. Be mindful. Know what you're doing. Put intention behind it. Don't do things empty. Don't do a movement empty. If you are not in the mood to do the training, do something else you're in the mood to do. That's not what I always say, but sometimes I do that. If I can see already somebody is in the training room and his energy is not correct, his mind is not there, is useless. Yeah. Sometimes they have other things on the mind that they would maybe prefer to do, or they still have some work on the mind where they think it's important, but uh, I cannot focus, then I better let them do that. Because the important part, no matter what it is, 
It is that reminder. It is up to your intention. It is your thoughts that is fueling the quality of life. And therefore, these are always just reminders. And yeah. And now coming from the cu cultural side, let's say, because in Asia anyway we drink so much tea. This is why always when drinking tea and seeing the cup, seeing the tea again, it's sooner or later, it's like subconsciously already you know, oh, that's the mindful time. Because of course it would be a lie to say that even if we are here in the monastery, that 24 hours you're mindful. No. Normally we are not. No human is. That's why we need to have structures, we need to have some method to, to reconnect us again, that remind us again. Remember, mindful. Mindfulness is key. Intention is key. So everywhere, hidden inside this whole complex of the monastery, we have this idea of be mindful. That's why, like behind you, you see all these different instruments of the of the gongs, and uh, it's our so-called sound altar behind there. Traditionally, not from Shaolin, but meanwhile we have so many different people coming here that they are reacting differently to certain methods. Some people like the breathing meditation or the moving, the moving arts. Some people understand the message by drinking tea. And other people understand the message by following a sound. Because no sound, again, is ever the same. It's like something slowly builds up and something slowly disappears. Just like everything. And this is why there are so many different so-called meditation methods. And we used to say, okay, you don't want to do Kung Fu, you don't want to do Qigong, you don't want to do Tai Chi Chuan, you also don't like the sitting meditation. Yeah, let's try out maybe listening, using the sounds as an object for your meditation. Maybe that is something that can re calibrate you, re remember yourself again. There is a different key for each door. And sometimes this is the role, let's say, of a teacher to sometimes figure out which one is the right key to open that one person. And that's why we call it, it is the closest way in this area where we are right now, is what we call the direct transmission. There are some things you can, of course, um, share on videos or share through books, but there is also something which ultimately can only be shared when flesh to flesh, human to human, sit next to each other. Mm -hmm. That is what we call it's the direct transmission. Yeah, I, th I, th I think just the idea of transferring these teachings to be mindful in day-to-day -day life, like the everything that you spoke about today, the ritual, the, you know, the thinking about the process of how this tea got here, the uniqueness of every single cup of tea, um, how do we apply that to, or how would you feel that people should apply that to their everyday lives? I think it's time to really give sense, to give purpose and to give an understanding to the things that you are encountering in this lifetime. In this talk, for example, today, we mention already very often mindfulness. That word is out in this world so often right now. But take your time and think about it. What does it actually refer to? How can you personally use that word in, com in combination with, with what I just try to, let's say, express over here. Mindfulness is not the absence of thoughts. You are not trying to get rid of the thoughts. Mindfulness means 
your mind is full mind full but it is full of something that you chose you individually chose this is my purpose this is my intention of why i'm doing something you do your work put some intention behind it you are speaking to a person be clear about your intention why are you speaking to the person you are texting something be clear about what is your intention why are you typing it and stop doing stuff in this world that doesn't mean anything to you and that has no intention because the whole point about why do i need this intention because only intention mobilizes energy and why do we need mobilized energy because only mobilized energy is creating something what do i mean if you continue doing stuff without intention the result is going to be the same you create nothing yeah so it, it's like you you never sent the messages because they were empty and so this is the moment now where f you practice from the moment you wake up in the morning don't do unnecessary things brushing the teeth is not unnecessary there is a purpose behind it there is an intention behind this you want your teeth to be healthy that is an intention you drink the coffee you would like that you wake up a little bit more and be a little bit more active why do you want to be a little bit more active because with that extra power with that extra energy you can work more efficiently you can um, work more you can work better you can do more things the whole day long and why would you want that because you want to help you want to contribute to something bigger there is a whole range of intention that each individual can put into his daily life yeah i can't say what are you supposed to uh, what type of intention you're supposed to put in there that is the special part that it is not about what you do it is about how you do the stuff how you are writing the messages how you are communicating with people how you are walking through this lifetime it doesn't matter what you do it's the how and this is something which is way bigger than than keeping than keeping it limited to a shaolin temple it's just that within this temple we have our ways but the underlying principle is not limited at all to this organization only is something which belongs out there to the humans to know it's just that that special part why i'm so enthusiastic sometimes about this topic is that i'm so happy that it still exists in this type of knowledge inside this temple but now growing up in the monastery and at the same time in this western world i see this one is missing out there but it belongs out mm -hmm. and this is why my my wish was always to find this combination that maybe started in the east or is found in the east but it needs to come back because in essence it is not separated it's just i don't know got blocked or got lost or whatever but this needs to come out thank you so much for this this is uh something i'll remember especially the tea and um yeah hopefully hopefully i should do this uh, I, i shouldn't say hopefully something i will transfer into my daily life as well is um being more mindful you know of, of for me if it's coffee even like those coffee beans didn't arrive 
um, out of thin air. Like there was a process to them. So uh, thank you so much for today. And, you know, we've spoken about a few things that we want to talk about in the future. I'm sure we'll get a chance to talk about it. And uh, if people are watching, they can tune into one of the other videos um, in the next few months and see um, what we talk about there. So thank you so much for joining us again. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much to Master Shahungi for doing this with us. We have some wonderful projects lined up in the future again. Um, and our good friend, Master Shahungi, and everybody at the Shaolin Temple is really excited to produce some more content. So at some point, you will see some new videos coming from this channel. So subscribe, hit the notification bell, and yeah, join the conversation down below. Thank you to everybody who supports us at mullingrose.com. You can now get the restocked, not a journal, the best success journal there is on the market and use code journal for 10% off at checkout um, while stocks last, guys. Thank you so much to everybody who with the feedback on this. We hope we have delivered to you the amazing product that we did um, before. And uh, yeah, we're really excited to drop this again. So thank you for watching. Have a blessed and productive day and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.